Today's guest on the Winning Teams podcast is Jeff Skipper, who hails from Alberta in Canada, in Calgary in Canada. Uh, Jeff is an international expert in design and leading change. And, you know, what a valuable topic to be talking about at this moment in time, because every organization that I come in co contact with or read about is going through enormous change. So to have the conversation uh, with Jeff about the book that he has published called Dancing with Disruption, which is a real how-to book. He's got 12 stages and he maps that out in the book very, very clearly. We, we dig into a number of those. But we really talk about how you know the role of the leader, uh, the important role of the leader, how the leader needs to be really show up as a coach, uh, a motivator, somebody who inspires, somebody who can set a vision, somebody who can set purpose. So it's not just the mechanics of being the manager. It's very much in that leadership space. But we also talk about the importance of how you start. But again, in the latter parts of the interview, we talk about how you need to finish a project like this and how important that is. And Jeff has got a really interesting take on on how to go about making sure that you finish well and that's not just about delivering but is making sure that all of the changes that you're talking about are fully uh, kind of loaded and are being implemented within the organization so you know jeff is a real expert in this space really worth listening to and i think you know his book as i said i highly recommend as a manual for anyone who's going through change as we all are and and really take it and go through it and let let it be your checklist of things that you need to watch out for. So sit back and listen to the very interesting Jeff Skipper. Jeff, thank you so much indeed for being a guest on the Winning Teams podcast. It's really lovely to have you here. I'm delighted to be here as well, John. I'm looking forward to this conversation. You're uh, portrayed as kind of an international expert in designing and leading change. And I'm just curious, how did you become that expert? Well, uh, honestly, I, I, I think I'm one of the fortunate few that saw a path through their career right from early stages. So I did my degree in organizational psychology. And, you know, that being the study of how do we set up an environment and motivate people to be their best at work. And right from that master's degree, started consulting. That was part of it. Um, and that's been a thread right throughout. Was able to um, do some independent work, joined up with IBM for 12 years, uh, doing lots of implementations. That was a great training ground until going out on my own in, in 2008 and working with lots of different organizations. Because change is a theme. Everyone's doing it. They, they can't avoid it. So uh, I love helping organizations succeed. If if I were to ask you, just just as you were talking, this question came to me. Mm. I mean, we we talk about living in this kind of the, this VUCA world, the volatile, uncertain, you know, yeah. complex and ambiguous, which which is true, and it could depend. It's more of one of some of the others, depending on the situation. But all organisations are really facing huge change. And if I were to ask you to say, you know, what is the number one thing you must get right? when you're facing significant change in a large organization. Is there one thing that you say, okay, above all and beyond, there's just this one, you just absolutely must get this right. Yeah, there's, there's one. I'm going to give you two phrases, but they're really like two sides of the same coin. On the one side, and we're seeing lots of interest in this now, is, is how do I build an organization that's resilient? Hmm. So one thing that the pandemic, pandemic really did for us as, as a favor is heighten the focus on mental well-being, wellness, and opened up uh, our ability to have that conversation. And if you don't have good mental well-being, you can't have resilience. People just, you know, they break down, they burn out. And that's the flip side of it is there's change fatigue that occurs and lots of interest in that. So we want to develop a resilient workforce so that we can avoid fatigue when it comes to change because people start saying, I've had enough. I need a break. Can we slow it down? And the reality is we can't. The change is unstoppable. If we stop for too long, someone else will eat, eat our lunch. So mm -hmm. resilience really is the, the big focus now for organizations. They have to get that right. And how do you build that resilience into an organization in order to sustain it? Because you say it's, you know, you can't just decide, okay, well, we're not going to bother for a while, you know, because somebody else will just grab, the, grab your lunch. And uh, right. how do you build that resilience into an organization? 
the majority of this is really about leadership and leadership style. For many organizations, leaders have been promoted up through the organization and really lack some key skills. And one of the, the most important is coaching. So everyone thinks they understand that. You know, we watch sports teams, we see what coaches do. But when it comes to really, um, I would say, getting up close and personal with an individual on our team, understanding what motivates them and knowing how to interact with them in a positive way to keep them moving and motivated, many leaders don't know how to do that. And that's where I spend a lot of my time now is in coaching, in training, uh, in that middle management layer, especially to help them develop individuals and build up their resilience. Mm. Interesting, because in the book that you that you published, the, you know, the dancing. I love the title, "Dancing with Disruption: Leading Dramatic Change During Global Transformation." And you know, and all those words are very obviously very carefully chosen. But right. you know, you, you do kind of go through twelve strategies. So, if I want to come back, let me just come back to the leader. You're talking about the leader as as a coach, but what else? What is the what is the role of the leader in that transformation? Because it's complex, isn't it? It is. There's there's so many aspects to this. Um, so we start at the beginning and the leader has to be good at painting the picture of the future. Now, I have to comment on that to start with, because for many leaders, CEOs, C-level, um, they're good at talking about the numbers. So we're going to do this. We've taken on a new strategy. Uh, we're implementing a new approach. We're, we're buying another company. And it's to drive numbers, growth numbers, improve our customer sat, things like that. But we really want leaders to be able to paint a picture. Numbers are okay at motivating, but when you say, here's how a change is going to enhance someone's life, whether it's a customer or our employees, we start to Im imbue uh, a sense of purpose in that future. So that's number one, being able to paint a, a vivid picture of where we're going. And then second is really connecting with individuals. So you talk about broad-based communication, Many leaders say, hey, we're going to cascade message messages, and I expect my leaders through the organization to relay those, but it's like a game of broken telephone. Uh, so they, they apply their own interpretation. Not every, everything gets through. Uh, so being able to connect with individuals through the entire organization to ensure they're getting the message, they understand it, and they know that they're a valued part of the journey from point A to point B is, is critical. Then we have standard leader uh, 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 tasks like freeing up resources, ensuring people have what they need to be successful, and then encouraging folks all along the way, putting the metrics in place that are going to drive the right behaviors. All of these are important elements. And like you said, it's complex. We have to weigh in at each time and figure out how much of each one of these do I need to apply in order to move people. It's interesting when you're talking there about, you know, it's it's inspiring people. So it's it's clarifying the purpose. Uh, and the purpose is not just let's make profit, you know, or let's hit a, hit a number, uh, whatever, or in revenue, whatever whatever that might be. I'm not diminishing the importance of making a profit because mm -hmm. you don't make a profit, you don't do a business. But when you're talking about inspiring the people to be really engaged with it, how do you go by, about inspiring kind of a large cohort of people? Because we're all inspired by different things. We're not inspired by the same thing. So it's not right. a one size fits all. Right. How do you, as the leader, navigate that to make sure that you are really inspiring people with what inspires them as opposed to what you think inspires them? Yeah, it's a great question because there is an assumption that if I do broad communication and I do the, the with them, what's in it for me, point out those mm -hmm. benefits, we're covered, right? But no, as you said, um, I, I take a look at the different personas in the audience. So you do have a large group that is, you know, they're they're invested in the organization, they're committed. So getting that message, yeah, we've got it, we're bought in, and away we go. But then you've got folks who aren't really as invested, and uh, you know, they may be there just to punch the clock and, and take home a more paycheck. We've got other folks that are highly exuberant. Others are focused on. Um, um, let's say environmental integrity. So, so different motivators. So we end up coming back to this reality. And this is why I said, you know, leaders aren't, aren't often equipped for this, but broad-based messaging, it still takes that middle management layer, direct supervisor to check in with individuals and, Hey, how are you doing? What do you think of the message that just came out? Do you see yourself getting there successfully? And only in those one-on-one -on -one conversations, do we get the reveal of, 
yeah, I've, I've got some concerns. And now that leader has the opportunity to tailor the message, alter it somehow to speak to them. Can you see how this actually might provide this benefit, which appeals to that person? Mm -hmm. So, so when we look at leading change, it is very much broad based, but we convince people to get on board at a one-on-one -on -one individual level and leaders need to be having those conversations. Yeah, because what you often see, and I mean, and you and I both work with some large organizations is when there is a project, mm -hmm. uh, a significant project um, that, that an organization is embarking upon, what you often see is that, you know, it's cross-functional because you get represent from IT, you get customer service, product development, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all put together. But they, so they put the collection of individuals but they don't. I know you touch on this in 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 the book, you know, dancing with disruption, uh, because you do have it set out in kind of twelve. It's, it's very much a workbook. You've got the twelve strategies right. to do that. So I'm just kind of leaning into this particular part. How do you how do you go about? Because there's a big difference between a collection of individuals and a team, and it's a team that you need to actually make this happen. So how do you build that connectivity between the team? Because for each of those teams, they also have another boss somewhere else in the organization right. that they're reporting into it. So it's not straightforward. So how would you go about really making sure that's a very, you know, kind of finely honed team? Yeah. And so having a common purpose is critical. And one of the strategies that's often used by leaders to achieve that is describing a, a common enemy. So in other words, Yes, you have to be good at painting the picture and setting out the goal, but also as important as saying, what are the consequences if we don't go that direction? Or what are the consequences of non-compliance, as I sometimes like to phrase it? So if we don't go in this direction, we've got a different future on the horizon, and it looks like this. So I think there's, there's two elements. The one is be very descriptive around the goal and what's that going to mean and how is that going to better people's lives? But then if we don't go in that direction, these are the consequences of failure. And that tends to unify groups because we see people get together to defeat enemies. That's that's very common practice. And the if you're talking about the 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 the, the starting with a clear go, but you also mentioned there, Jeff, that as you're going through, particularly in a project that's that can be, you know, quite over a long period of time. You do have, you can have kind of shifts in terms of what the, what the result is going to be, or what the outcome or the output is go is going to be. How do you how do you make sure that you're you're bringing the people along with you on that journey, as opposed to people saying, "We don't know where we're going. We keep on changing." Right. No, that's true. I just had this question uh, from someone coming in of, "What do you do when the scope changes? There's a change in the timeline. Uh, something we we expected is now not going to come to fruition, um, because that can be a real credibility hit for leaders, and that's that's a danger. Um, if folks lose faith in their leaders, they stop following. Um, so, number one, near the outset, you know, we've painted that nice picture, but we do need to make it clear to folks." Things are going to change along the way. I think you and I are both aware of that uh, adage, you know, no plan survives first engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so setting up that expectation is there's going to be shifts along the way. But something powerful I put in the hands of leaders is to say, you're painting the picture, but it's in broad strokes. And think of that uh, paint by number and there's detail in there and that detail still needs to be filled in. And that's where employees need to come into the picture is to, to, to tell them, you're going to be engaged in helping us um, really determine what that journey looks like and what we need to do to get there. Yes, we generally know we're going in this direction, we're gonna do certain things, but in terms of how it gets done on a day-to-day -day basis, we're gonna need input and you folks are closest to the work. So you're gonna to have to inform us. So getting everyone in the boat together, we're gonna to be all gonna be part of this process. We know there may be changes along the way and that we're relying on one another to help uh, pivot and shift where required to make sure we stay on course or we still get to a, a positive destination. Mm -hmm. And if you look on that journey, one of the, I mean, and you do talk about this in, in, in the book, is is about stakeholders. And I I kind of I I've, it's one of my pet subjects is is talking about stakeholders because I very often think that it can be missed out um, and and not given the attention that that it deserves. And your know, stakeholders come in all kind of shapes and sizes. So, right. but how how important is it to really dig into 
and spending investing time at the outset to really determine those stakeholders and how do you engage with those stakeholders and how do you keep them engaged yeah um one of the examples i give in the book is 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 if we look at what happened during the pandemic you know we first came out with these uh, these general rules of you need to wear a mask you need to sanitize and keep six feet apart okay and and to you and i yeah it's a hassle but pretty straightforward i can do that stakeholder assessment goes in and says well who are my different groups so for you and i general public no problem now let's take someone that that has breathing problems or has medical issues someone who's less mobile um all of a sudden we start seeing barriers. They're going to struggle with what we see as, as simple rules. So we have to know our stakeholders, but know them in detail to determine how they might react and respond to the change we're trying to roll out because people do react differently. So we keep drilling down. If we take a typical organization, I can say all my employees need to do A, B, and C. But if I now look at the finance group, well, actually A and B don't really apply to them, but D and E do, they're gonna to need to do that. If I look at my operations team, they've got a couple other things that apply to them. So really understanding your stakeholders in some level of detail is important. And I always suggest keep breaking down that group until you've got common needs. So even within finance, my accounts payable may be quite different from my accounts receivable group in terms of their needs or the impact of this change on them. So we keep exploring to see what their needs and reactions might be and how they might be different. Mm. You, you, I, I know that 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 in the book you kind of use the pandemic as kind of a background, and mm. and 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 it was. I mean, when you when you think about it. It was an extraordinary time, and probably still is to an to an extent, and the impact yes. of it. But I mean, yeah, you know, how quickly organizations could shift from you know everybody being in the office to everybody working at home. I mean, was 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 quite quite extraordinary. Right. I mean, I know we're not are not out, but I know there's still the big debate about kind of hybrid working, remote working, in the office and all that sort of stuff. But if you look at it from a from a change management expert perspective. What do you think are the lessons that we have learned? And what do you think are the lessons that we still have to learn from that experience? Mm -hmm. One of the big lessons learned that came from that is there was such a disparity in people buying into, okay, we've got to do these things to try and keep everyone safe. First notable element is the threat was death. Okay, let's be clear on that. If if you didn't comply, we've got this new virus. We're, we're not sure what the solution is yet. You know, we didn't have a vaccine at the be, at beginning, and it really was taking people's lives. And yet some people didn't get on board. So, you know, threats don't necessarily do it. Um, they, they work on some, but not on everyone. Why is that? Next factor is inconsistency. I think that was the, the biggest issue we had is you had one leader saying, okay, here's what we know and therefore what we're going to do. And you had another leader saying, yeah, I think that's that's bogus. We're not doing that. Um, I don't think that does that has any benefit for our population. So because we've all got access to information online and it, all these people claiming to be experts, so we're trying to guess who's got the most credibility, um, but different messages, different outcomes. Even within Canada, if you looked across the nation, because provinces could operate independently, you had different standards. I mean, we did close borders between provinces. I remember driving up to a border, like, where are all the cars? Oh, we're not supposed to go over this line, turn around, go back. Um, so, so this variability meant that we weren't, weren't sure who to trust. Um, as our leaders learned new things, gained more information, studies were completed. Okay, now this is safe and that's not. So the rules changed. All these things really hampered credibility and made it difficult for people to believe and act. So uh, number one lesson uh, that I think is a takeaway is we have to be so careful as leaders to be consistent. If you're the leader of a major change, ensuring that your direct reports are bought in and saying the same message, because if they start to add their own interpretation or they shift something, it creates doubt. As soon as I look to two leaders and see that message is somewhat different, I will hesitate. And that's the last thing we want during change. We need people to feel confident that they can take a step forward, that they have support, and that if they fail, someone's going to be there to, to help them get up and keep going. Mm. It, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, it, it, you know, you look, you look at where we are now, 
and 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 as I said earlier on, I'm mean, sure you're experiencing it with your clients. Is that you know different companies are having a very different experience or even a, a different reflection on how they view kind of working from home, working from the office, some trying to get you into the office, some trying to get people to stay at home, people saying, oh, no, I don't want to go into the office, or yes, I do want to go into the office. Where do you think that is going to land? Or where? how do you see that rolling out over the next period of time? I know that's difficult because it's not, you can't put a one size fits all. But we did kind of go from pretty much a one size fits all. And now, mm-hmm. we've got a, now we've got a suite of options. Are we just going to stay with a suite of options? Or are we going to drift back to going back into the office more, do you think? No, I think we're locked in. So hybrid's here to stay. Um, And then put on top of that, the experiments that are going on around the four day work week. So can we compress um, our, our, our work time even more and free, you know, create a longer weekend who doesn't want that. And, and what we're seeing as, as people get a taste of something different and they like it, we have a hard time letting go of that. So it's, it's interesting to me uh, to see this very strong push in our organizations to retain, um, these advantages, and they're now seen as rights. I have the right to work from wherever I want, as long as I'm putting in and delivering in, delivering the performance that my boss is looking for. And I think that's legitimate. Um, leaders need to recognize that some folks do work really well from a remote location. I rarely go out and see clients myself. It's, it's all virtual, but it doesn't work for everyone. I've just been hearing more people um, saying, I, get, I have a real hard time with distraction in my home environment. And so how do we make sure those folks can be effective uh, in, in performing? So there is still a role for the office. I think hybrid's here to stay, but here's the overall um, arching theme we need to pay attention to. Community is still critical. So folks want to be a part of something They want to be a part of a group, some more than others, but knowing I've got peers, I can bounce ideas off them, someone to um, just enjoy a laugh with or a moment. These are important elements. If you look at folks coming together again at conferences or, you know, there's a big town hall meeting for an organization, you see folks in groups talking and they're catching up with one another and there may be some of that laughter. And that's so powerful, creates bonding moments, it increases trust. So we have to find ways to, for our folks to to continue to feel that they're a part of community, regardless of where they work. Yeah, I think the community piece is 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 so hugely important, um, and but I, I and I think that it, there's also a generational piece to this as well, of, of which which some some generations we've got more generations in the workforce now than we've ever had before, and I think that's actually um, making it a little bit more complex. I want to talk about in the strategy 12, number 12 that you talk about in the book mm. uh, and that the title of that of that is kind of wrap it up. Closing means cleaning up. Right. And, 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 and the reason that it, that appeared to me is that one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that very often when we come to the end of a project, we just kind of finish and move on right <laughs> to the next one. And we don't actually spend time learning about it kind of figuring out what went well, what didn't go well, what do we learn and what can we bring into the next one? So we don't actually bring the learning in. But what do you mean by kind of, you know, cleaning up? Well, one in one sense, it's very practical. Yeah, I put my uh, Indiana Jones archaeology hat on and it's, it's looking around, seeing what artifacts are still saying that we're in a transition instead of completed. Um, so if you walk around and just look... Uh, you know, in banks, especially, you can see on the floor where they had those stickers that said "stand six feet apart." There's, you know, there's <laughs> it's dirtier around that circle, um, which was covered for a period of time. So there's still signs around. You'll you'll find there are masks kind of you know along the curb of the road. Um, all that stuff really needs to be cleaned up if we're going to say we've moved on. In a project sense, I can remember um, going through a branch of an organization and finding one of the posters I designed a year before to say, hey, get ready for this change. There it is up on the boards. We've already done that. Like to me, it's embarrassing that's still there. Uh, but those artifacts still remain. Um, outside of that, um, sustainability is is so important to any major change. We don't want We want to maximize our our returns. We don't want people to go back into old ways of working. So being very planful about how we transition a project into everyday business, 
who will be the owner of anything that's brand new, how are our metrics changing? So what we measure and declare a success that should be updated and reflect what's new and not reinforcing previous ways of working. Um, any training, training tends to be, hey, you used to do it this way, now you're gonna do it that way. Again, needs to be updated to just reflect, this is the way it is today. So when a new person walks in, they're onboarded, they're getting trained on the current state, not anything looking back to previous state. So all these little elements, which to me are cleanup items, if we don't do them, they send a signal that we're not quite there yet. And that's not the image we want to portray. We want to say we've arrived and this is now steady state. It's part of the new reality. I love that. I think that that's really good. And Jeff, I think that the, your, your book, Dancing with Disruption, is, is excellent. Uh, I think it's a real manual and how to, I think for people, anybody going through change, I think you map out those kind of 12, 12 stages very, very, very well. Before uh, you can tell people where they can reach you. Two questions I ask everybody. One is a book other than your own uh, right. that you've read that's had an impact upon you. Curious what the book is and what was the impact? Yeah, and it's it's going back many years, but I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Edgar Schein. So when I was working on my master's degree, he was a name that came up as kind of the, one of the, the fathers of looking at and understanding organizational culture. And that's the name of the book. Um, but he laid out, these are the elements of it. This is why you can't just, you know, throw values on the wall and say, that's our culture. It runs much deeper than that. So understanding that behaviors are, you know, based on attitudes, which are based on beliefs, which tend to be under the surface, not easily recognized. Um, so that thinking has been very instrumental. I'm working with an organization right now that's looking to shift their culture. Not an easy thing to do, but can be done. Interesting book. In, in, yes. Interesting book. Yeah, I'm, I, that, that's not one that I've read. So that's a nice one to get to the list. So I'm yeah. glad to hear. I love getting new ones. And second one is daily rituals. If you have them, what are they and how do they serve you? There's one I really like to share. And that is, um, um, so, so I'm a big fan of lists. So I've got my notepad right here to make sure I stay on track for the day. But it's at the other end of the day that I have a, have a ritual that I think is very important for all of us. And that is to take a moment to reflect on the day. So I look at my list of actions, what did I get done and what didn't get done? Sometimes I didn't complete anything. And that may be because I was interrupted, an emergency came up, but it doesn't mean that nothing happened. And it can be dis disappointing to people when they look, oh, I didn't get anything done. But that point of reflection to consider, but what progress was made, what did get completed, and what can I take out of this that was positive? Even if there was a failure, something went off the rails, I've learned something. So a moment of reflection, extract what was good and then reset for the day. And then finally, to actually declare out loud, my day's done. For me, I, I like using that um, lofty phrase, it is finished. And then I let go. There's no more work to be done for the day and I can relax and, and enjoy family and some downtime. Uh, but that point of reflection and just declaring the day is done, I found is a very important habit. So it's a clear cutoff from the workday. That's right. Yes. I love that. I think that, that that's that's really effective. Jeff, this was great. Where can people get in touch with you? We'll put everything in the notes, but if they're listening right now, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, everything is on my website, which is at jeffskipperconsulting.com. And that includes not only my, my regular writings and my blog, but there's a lot of free resources in there. I've, I've tried to give back to the community myself uh, during my own development. So everything on the site, the book is available on Amazon and pretty much every other outlet you can think of. Yeah, well, I certainly highly recommend the book. And I, you know, having having been around your site, there is a ton of resources that are really, really, really good. So it's worth a visit to get the resources, if nothing else. Jeff, thank you so much for being a guest. It's been a real pleasure to have you here today. You're welcome, John. It was a pleasure for me as well.